Okay, I'm gonna move along. I should mention he had nothing to disclose, I have nothing to disclose. I'm gonna talk about bowel obstruction. Um, so again, three goals for these 10 minutes or 11 or 12 minutes or however bad I run over uh, to discuss the importance of patient selection uh, in achieving the best outcomes because again, I'll go back that patient selection is so much, uh, it so overrides everything else that we look at. Reviewing the available data on the outcome difference between the uses of laparoscopy and laparotomy in the treatment of small bowel obstruction and to describe the safe technical steps and a few take home points about how to approach these patients. Um, bowel obstructions uh, due to internal hernias from, from bariatrics or, or due to external hernias, which uh, you're going to hear talk on next, I, I've left for, for those speakers. Uh, I specifically uh, am going to address adhesiolysis, which is the lion's share of, of, uh, of what bowel obstruction uh, is from. So the first description in the literature of a laparoscopy is in a use for uh, small bowel obstruction is from a gynecologist in 1991, Dr. Bastug. One patient, one adhesion, cut it and reported it. And since then, uh, the literature initially, and this was the, in the very early days of the laparoscopic revolution, um, mostly described in the gynecologic literature for chronic pain and for infertility. Uh, but there are stu uh, studies that started to come out. There's just not a lot of them. And they're mostly, in fact, to that point, all retrospective. Uh, to the point where the Cochrane Review, uh, the conclusion that when they did their review in 2010 was that there was no conclusion because there were no published or unpublished, randomized or unrandomized perspective controlled trials to be able to make a statement about this, that there were a handful of retrospective clinical control trials that suggested some of the advantages you'd normally see for laparoscopy, which is shorter hospital stay and uh, mortality reduction, but again, that could be a bias based on the reporting. So we got to surgical endoscopy re uh, report in 2012, um, 29 studies. This was a, a, a review uh, of the literature of the laparoscopic approach to small bowel obstruction, uh, 2,005 patients. And of those, uh, two-thirds of them were completed laparoscopically. Uh, a handful were lap-assisted. Even smaller amount were converted for, for standard hernia repair. Uh, and a third were converted to laparotomy. So about two-thirds finished laparoscopically and, and a third converted to laparotomy. Digging down, what, what was common about the ones that needed to be converted? Dense adhesions, uh, and I think that's the most common reason that people convert is, is you get into hostile territory and you, you don't feel safe cutting through what you're looking at, so you convert to open to feel more comfortable, and I think we've all been there. Uh, the necessity for bowel resection, uh, which can come in the form of either making a small counter incision over the area where you need to resect versus the need for a full laparotomy if you're, if you're unclear for the extent of how far you have to search or, or, or resect. Not able to identify the pathology, that makes sense. You can't leave the operating room until you've done that. Uh, and then iatrogenic injury. Um, their enterotomy rate that they looked at in this series was 6.6%. That's the reported rate. Unclear whether that's the actual rate, but certainly uh, in enterotomy, if, if it's right there in front of you and you feel com comfortable with intracorporeal suturing, it's something that can be done, uh, but that was a, a, a reason for conversion in, in this study. Get to January of last year, uh, a NISQIP study uh, uh, in surgical endoscopy showing five years of, of putting together the words laparoscopy and small bowel obstruction found 9,600 patients. 15% um, of those uh, uh, treated with laparoscopic adhesiolysis, conversion rate 85%, or not conversion, but 85% of those were treated with an open repair. So only 15% during that five year period, at least in this group, were found to be done laparoscopically. Um, and what was found in that study? Well, the mean operative time was actually a little lower for laparoscopy. You could make the argument again that these were the single band adhesions, easy to see, easy to fix. Uh, post operative length of stay, half, which is, is what we know about laparoscopy. 30-day uh, mortality rates were a lot lower, but again, you could make the argument that maybe those patients were selected out for that reason. Similar study in August of that year, uh, looking at 4,600 patients with adhesive small bowel obstruction. Um, 990, uh, 919 of them had laparoscopic adhesiolysis, and 3,600 had an open repair, again, about the same breakdown. Uh, and looking at mortality rates, 0.8 versus 2.3 percent, better for laparoscopy. The overall complication rate was a third in the laparoscopic group, and the mean length of stay was half. So I think the conclusions you can make from that is that there certainly appear to be benefits in retrospectively added data, uh, but 
you have to temper it with the thought that maybe those benefits are real, but they're there because those patients were adequately selected and, and appropriately given the, the chance to be taken care of laparoscopically. There was a, a prospective trial announced in the, in the BMC Surgical Journal uh, that was going to take on a multi-year, multi-center perspective randomized control trial. For, uh, this is an overseas trial. Um, that's primary endpoint is going to be length of stay, uh, secondary endpoints, return of GI function, 30-day mortality, complications, uh, and post-operative pain. And we'll, hopefully we'll start getting that type of perspective data so that we don't have to always put down the laparoscopic advantages being to selection bias. So again, uh, there's really not a lot of data. That's what's there. Uh, but in practical take-home points, I want to spend the last few minutes of this talking about what you're going to do Monday morning or more likely Monday night when this occurs. Um, hemodynamic stability, going back to the opening talk of the day. Uh, hemodynamically unstable patients are not the best candidates for laparoscopic repair for all the reasons that you heard. Uh, when not only are uh, the being able to tolerate a pneumoperitoneum uh, with the hemodynamic changes and the ventilatory changes that, that occur from that, the timing uh, of, of the procedure, and that's really based on your skill level and how uh, severe the abdomen is going to be for the patient. But hemodynamically unstable patients are not good candidates for this. Prior procedures. Uh, if you have a patient who has one small abdominal scar and there's a chance that there's, there's a small amount of adhesions just related to that, uh, that may be a better candidate than the one that's got 10 railroad tracks going in every direction and has a frozen abdomen, and, and maybe that's not the patient to try laparoscopically. Uh, clinical exam, if they have tense perit uh, a tense peritoneal exam from obstruction or if they have peritonitis, those are not good candidates to, to start laparoscopically generally. Uh, the likely pathology, if, if you think it's related to a cancer or if you think it's a distal obstruction where the entire small bowel is going to be dilated and you're not going to have good domain inside the abdomen to be able to see or safely move around, those are going to be patients that may not be the best laparoscopic candidates. And then the experience of the surgeon and the surgical team, I put both down because you can be a laparoscopic wizard, but if it's 2 a.m., and you have the relief orthopedic team, and they don't, which you know happens to all of us, happens to me, and they, they're looking at both ends of the insufflator. <laughs> Move on. Do the safe thing. Um, so use your judgment with that. Technical points. What do you do with this patient? You've made the decision that, that they're a good laparoscopic candidate based on those features. Preparation. You saw the conversion rate, and that's not because sir, I'm sure that mo a lot of that conversion was were, these are reasonably safe surgeons doing this, and, and they did them for legitimate reasons, that conversion's not failure. And I think 25 years later, we still <coughs> somehow think that conversion from laparoscopy to open represents some sort of sigh and, and let the air out of the, the room enthusiasm, but sometimes that's the safe thing to do. And, and so be prepared to go open, because most of them do. Uh, have the open equipment in the room ready to go. Don't be at the table where you, you have a pneumoperitoneum, you have an enterotomy, you, you're in a hostile abdomen, and now you're asking for the open equipment, and your staff has to go run down the room and, and start getting everything together. Consent. The patient has to know that I'm going to try this laparoscopically, but there's more than a reasonable chance you're going to have an open procedure. Don't make them disappointed when they wake up with and you've used the 100-millimeter port on them because they, they need to know that. Um, positioning. Tucked, supine, and strapped well to the bed with good padding. If, if, if you, you're going to do this from start to finish, that patient's going to move a lot. Uh, typically, uh, and we talk about approach, uh, as with open bowel obstructions, at least for me, I, I, probably true for most of you, you're going to put that right side up, trend Ellenberg, so that you can elevate that cecum, find the term lilium, a reliable decompressed area of bowel, and march your way back. Uh, and then you don't know where the positioning is going to take you, but make sure that that patient is movable. You're already working in a less than adequate abdominal domain uh, with, with a, a hostile area. Uh, have the positioning working for you so that you can have bowel fall away from the area. So the patient has to be positioned well. The abdominal entry, totally beyond the scope of this talk to argue about various needles versus open entry, although with dilated bowel and a tense abdomen, uh, I'm an open entrant anyway routinely, and I would really advocate for the, the, the use of putting the various needles away for getting into these abdomens. Um, we talked about the approach. Finally, just judgment. I'm, I'm 
running out of time, so I'll go through these last few points quickly. Um, you should be making progress. You, you should be uh, moving through to, if, if you looked at the same window, the same piece of bowel for 15 minutes and nothing has progressed and nothing has happened, you need to do something. Whether it means we, we, we use usually three to five ports uh, to, to do this, move your camera around a lot, move your angles around. Uh, if you're not happy with the area that you're cutting, go somewhere else. You should be able to see through anything that you cut, obviously, I'm talking to an experienced audience. Um, but you have to be making progress. If it has stopped and you're frustrated and, and progress isn't being made, that's, as we all know, is where bad things start to happen. That's the time to, to either change your view, change what you're doing, or change your exposure. And then there's that moment of truth. You gotta just be willing to make that decision. And it's, it's not a failure. Um, I think I'm done. So consider converting if bowel diameter is greater than four centimeters and you've lost too much of that abdominal domain. It's a distal obstruction where the entire small bowel is out dilated and you have no domain to work in. The small bowel is matted and you're gonna be at a higher rate for anaerotomy. Dense adhesions where it's just difficult to see where your planes are. Perforation or necrosis. Uh, where uh, resection may be necessary and laparoscopic approach may be difficult, and if you can't see, you can't move. So my take-home point is the laparoscopic approach to adhesiolysis is appropriate, and selected patients has consistently shown benefits in those retrospective studies, but it's all related to patient selection and to your comfort level as a surgeon and a team. Sorry I went so over. Thank you. Very much, John. Actually, we'll take. Uh, there's been some interesting questions. Keep them coming. Uh, one question for you. Um, it was asked uh, whether, in repairing a perforated duodenal ulcer, would you place a J tube at the same time? And if so, would you put that in laparoscopically? I. Not a huge fan of laparoscopic J tubes. Uh, I'm huge. I. I'm, always, I'm an enthusiast for doing anything laparoscopically where the patient's going to see a benefit. I have found, and maybe it's just me and the way I put them in, but I, I, I've had issues with uh, leaks and, and complications from laparoscopically J-tubes, and, and it may just be the technique that I use. Uh, I think that uh, for patients who have bad perforations, who have peritonitis, who it's clear they're going to not be, uh, or if, if the uh, diameter is large uh, from the ulcer, then I am a fan of, of enteral feeding and early enteral feeding, so I would place one. 